You know, it's 2 Samuel 23. The Bible tells about King David and all of his mighty exploits and talks about King David's mighty men. They were great warriors. It says, among all of David's mighty men, there were three that stood out above all the rest. One of them was a guy who was chief among the mighty men. In other words, he was the greatest fighter of them all. And his name was Joseph Bashabeth, which is a mouthful to say. But it says that he went into battle one day and he slew 800 Philistines. One man killed 800 by the sword. The second guy was Eleazar, and Eleazar and some of the nation of Israel were t- or taunting the Philistine army, and the Philistine army advanced on them, and the Israelite army fled. They ran away, but Eleazar stayed, and he fought the battle by himself, and at the end of the battle, it said his hand grew weary to the point that they had to peel his fingers off of his sword. He couldn't let go after that fight and that battle. But then there's the third of the mighty men, and his name is Shema. And I want you to turn with me today to 2 Samuel chapter 23. Look at verse 11 and 12. The third mighty man was Shema. It said, next to him was Shema, the son of Hagi, the Herite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. So the Israelites run in fear of the Philistine army. But Shema took a stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and he struck the Philistines down. And the Lord brought about a great victory. A great victory that day. Now picture that if you will. Here is the the army of the Philistines advancing on Israel. And Israel's army. And suddenly all the Israelites turn and they run. Except for one man. One man takes a stand in the middle of the field of lentils. And he says, I will defend this land with boldness and confidence, with not even one thought in his mind of running and turning back. He stayed there, and he fought off all the Philistines by himself, and he defended that field of lentils. Whenever I think about taking a stand, I'm always inspired by Shema. Of course, we we don't stand on a sword, a physical sword, but we stand on the sword of the Word of God. And we make our stand in Christ Jesus. So we're entering into a series called The Stand. And I'm inspired by this. I'm going to inspire you today. I want to encourage you to rise up and to take your stand as well. So let's go ahead and take a moment, if you will, and let's get our notes out. We're going to be filling in some blanks today. Inside your handout are some notes. You can pull those out. And if you're watching online, you have notes as well. Yours in the house looks like this, but... You online can go to YouVersion, you can go to events, type in Believer's Church and your notes will come up there. And one of the reasons we want to make a stand, because we want to make this statement today, put this in your notes. If you don't stand for something, you may fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. Now, I really believe that in my heart, all of us, every one of you, you have a desire, an eternal desire within you to make a difference in this world. To have something to stand for, something that you're willing to fight for, something that you feel very strongly about, and you want to stand for that thing. But at the same time, we live in a very, uh, a world, very informational world where we have all kind of thoughts, ideas, ideologies, worldviews thrown at us all the time. And sometimes we get so confused, we just don't know what to stand for. And as a result, a lot of people just say, well, I'm, I'm just not going to stand for it anything. I'm just going to kind of let things roll. Now, the problem with doing that is suddenly you open yourself up to deception. And there are two deceptions we need to consider here. One, being deceived by other people and what they're telling you. But then once you're convinced that something else is true rather than the truth itself, we enter into probably the greatest deception known to mankind is self-deception. Where we believe in ourselves and we're totally deceived and nobody can talk us out of it. So we want to make sure that we're standing on the right thing. And again, if you don't stand for something, you're liable to fall for anything. So let me just tell you this. Maybe we need to remind ourselves that what we stand on, we stand on the gospel of Christ Jesus. Put that in your notes. Stand on the gospel. Stand on the gospel. When Paul was writing to Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, he said, Now, brothers, 
I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you and which you received. So first of all, let me remind you that I preached to you that gospel, you remember? And then I, then also you received the gospel, so you received salvation. And now what does he tell them to do? You uh, preached it, you received it, on which you have now taken your what? Stand. We've taken our stand on the gospel of Christ Jesus. Now, the gospel is the good news that God loves you. God wants to have a relationship with you, and God has come to extreme measures to reestablish that relationship with you. He's allowed his son Jesus to come to this earth, to live a life as a man, but yet be sinless, and to be crucified, to pay the price for your sins, and to be raised from the dead, to breathe life into you, and to change your life so that you can be what the Bible calls born again. Now, that's good news. That's, that's what I would call the gospel to give you something that I'm willing to make my stand on. And I'd have to say, like the Apostle Paul said in Romans 16, 1, I am not, excuse me, Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So I don't have to be ashamed of the gospel, the good news. I don't have to apologize for the gospel I don't have to try to rationalize the gospel to someone. I don't have to explain the gospel away because the gospel is the truth and the gospel is what I made my stand on and I cannot think of a better stand to make than to stand on the gospel of Christ Jesus and his message. As a matter of fact, I would say this, I know that it's truth. I know that it brings life because I have experienced it. Now, people are always saying, well, you know, they're always discovering things. They, the Dead Sea Scrolls, maybe just Shroud or Turan, whatever it may be. And all these things kind of point out that the gospel is true. And I'm thinking, well, that's great. And you can uncover all those facts and you can uncover even more facts. But I don't need those facts to believe in Christ Jesus because I've already experienced the gospel in my heart. And Jesus has radically changed my life. He's the one that gives me life every day. He breathes his life into me. I'm enabled by the power of his Holy Spirit, and you are as well. And so that's something for us to stand on to make sure that our stance is not based on the world or in the opinion of the world, but on the gospel of Christ Jesus. So as we're going through this today, I'm going to get you to make several statements of what we're going to stand on, and we'll start with this one. I want everyone to say, on the gospel, I make my stand. Maybe you lift your sword up. On the gospel, I make my stand. I make my stand on the gospel of Christ Jesus. What a great place to make your stand. As we're doing that, I want you to think about this also, that the gospel is something that we should be willing to live for, but also to die for. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 35, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the, what? for the gospel will save it. If you want to save your life, be willing to give it up for the gospel. Now, I want to share with you a next step today. We have three next steps. They're in your notes. They're also in your handout. These are your sermon notes. It's on your handout that uh, Allie asked you to fill out. And next steps are sort of like a take-home assignment. What am I going to do after we walk out of here today? What are my next steps? And if you'd look at yours and you'd agree to it, you would just check this little circle. And it says, today's next step, I will make my stand on the gospel rather than any other worldview. I don't have faith in any other worldview, but other than the gospel of Christ Jesus, this is where I'm going to make my stand. So the first thing is stand on the gospel. The second thing I'd say to you today is God makes us stand firm in Christ. God is working with you here. God is going to make you to be able to stand firm in Christ Jesus. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22, he said, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. God makes us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He put a seal of ownership on us, and he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Now, when it says God makes you stand firm in Christ, it doesn't mean that God is forcing you to do that, but God makes it possible. God has made a way through Christ Jesus for you to make your stand on Christ and on the gospel. It's not something that we do in and of ourselves, but God is working with us. There's a lot in that verse, so let's just kind of unpack it a, a piece at a time for a minute. And the first thing it says, God 
makes us stand firm. Now that word firm there, it means steadfast. It means secure. It's actually a legal term. Like you've firmed up the deal. It is settled. It's firm. It's legally declared that you make your stand in Christ Jesus. Not only does he make it firm, but then it says he anoints us. The anointing of oil in the Old Testament and in the New Testament represented the Holy Spirit coming upon somebody. Oftentimes when they would anoint them to be a priest, they'd pour oil over their head and float on their head, down their hair, down their beard, all the way to their lower garments, uh, symbolizing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So God has given us the anointing of His Holy Spirit and empowers us by His Spirit to make our stand. Not only that, but by the Holy Spirit, it goes on to say he has sealed us. He's given us his seal. Paul said that God set his seal of ownership on us. In the Bible, a a document would be written to identify something that indicate who its owner was, and its owner would protect the item in question. So basically he's saying that God identifies us as his own. We find our identity in Christ Jesus. And yes, our owner, who is God, is going to be the one to protect us at all times. So we are owned by God. We belong to him. And it is all settled. It's all sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Paul talks about this as well. And he says, you And you also were included in Christ. When you were included in Christ, when you received him as your Savior, when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of salvation, what happened? When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. You were marked in him with a seal. And what is that seal? The promised Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is our seal and our guarantee. He's the guarantee, as we continue to read here in Ephesians 1.14, He's to guarantee a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. So until Jesus comes back and gets us in the rapture, or until we die and go to be with Him, we have a guarantee of our inheritance, a down payment, if you will, and that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit saying, this is a done deal. It's like a, a prepayment. It's a down payment. It's a guarantee. It's like earnest money, you might say. But the Holy Spirit has been given to you and should remind you every day as you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, as you're being filled with the Holy Spirit daily, as you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, as you're walking in the Holy Spirit, as you have the fruits and the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in your life. That is your guarantee to remind you that, yes, you will spend all eternity with Christ Jesus. So we are marked and we are sealed by Jesus. So we're going to make our stand and we're going to be firm in Christ. The first thing, we stand firm on the gospel. Let's say this together. Say, we stand firm in Christ Jesus. We stand firm in Christ. So you stand firm in Christ Jesus. The third thing is this. Because we've been set free, we can stand firm. Set free from what? We'll set free from our old nature, our sin nature. The Word of God tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, I'll read three verses about this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Christ set you free from the bondage of sin. Now, what are you supposed to do after you're set free? What does it say? Stand firm. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. The yoke of slavery to sin. So many of us say, well, we're going to stand firm in Christ. We're going to stand in that field to lend us. We're going to make our stand, but then sin begins to tug at us and pull at us, and we find ourselves going back to our old dead nature and dabbling in some of the things that we should not have been dabbling with in the first place, and we fall, and we don't make our stand. But the Bible said, no, we're not to let that happen to us. We're free from sin, therefore we are to stand firm. We also should heed Paul's warning His warning to us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, he says, So, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You think, well, I've got this thing. I'm standing firm. Nothing's going to get me. I've got it. I've got it made. He says, be careful. Make sure you are. Because the devil is trying every trick and every deception to make you go back and make choices that lean into his plan to kill, steal, and destroy rather than Jesus' plan to give you life and life more abundantly. 
So you need to make sure that you really are standing firm. Don't just think that you're there. Know you're there. That's why I want to stir you up today. I want you to say, no, I want to make sure that I'm standing firm in Christ Jesus and I'm set free from this bondage of sin. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Now, don't we like to say, well, my temptation is worse. You know, more comes at me than comes at everyone else. And he says, no, no, no. Same thing, everybody. All, it's all common. You're not experiencing any temptation. No one else is experiencing. He said, but God is faithful and he will not allow you, he will not allow the temptation to be more, look at what it says, more than you can stand. I'm standing here, but the temptation is pulling me away. I can't help it. Yes, you can. The temptation is not more than you can stand. God won't allow that to happen. When you're tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. You know, we have a problem, Christians have a problem with this issue, this three-letter word called sin, where we're, it's been set free, we've been delivered, but we still want to, by choice, go back and dabble in it again. And I want to tell you, a lot of people have this attitude. They say, well, my sin is something between me and God. It's a personal thing. You know, I, I know that whenever I sin, I can ask Jesus to forgive me, and he's going to forgive me. It's not going to hurt anyone else but me, and I can ask for mercy and grace. And like we've had a million sermons on before, he's going to forgive you every time. He's going to wipe that sin away. And that is true. But we do not understand how much our sin affects other people and the actions that we do. I have a sermon. I don't know when we'll get to preach on it again. I've preached on it here before, but um, the name of the sermon is, How Much Is Your Sin Going to Cost Me? How much is your sin going to cost me? Because whenever I sin, it costs you something. When you sin, it costs me. There's a cause and effect. Will Christ Jesus forgive me when I sin? Will he forgive me? Yes, he will. But Janet is still going to suffer the consequences of my sin. My children and my family are going to suffer the consequences of my sin. The church will suffer the consequences of my sin. So it's just not about me, God, and my sin. Whenever I sin or you sin, it affects other people around you. And you've got to get your eye on that. You know, sometimes there could be things that you are tempted to do, and you think, well, you know, I could just do it and ask Jesus to forgive me, but I'm not going to do it. Because of my children, this is not a, something I want to pass on to them. I don't want them to fall into this same pattern in their life. I want God's blessings upon my family, so therefore I'm not going to participate in this sin because I don't want to block the full blessings of God's life. But understand this, that your sin hurts other people, not just you. So we need to make sure that we're making our stand firm, free from the bondage of sin. We're not going to be held and captive to sin no more. So say, everybody say, I stand free, stand free. free from sin. Free. You're free from sin and you're standing firm, free from the bondage of sin. The next one is this. We're going to have to stand firm in faith. Got to have faith. Man, it's going to take some faith to do this. In 1 Corinthians 4, 13 and, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, Plus, I want to add 2 Corinthians 1.24 together. It says, be on guard, stand firm in what? Stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. Add to that 2 Corinthians 1.24, it is by faith you stand firm. How do you do it? You do it by faith. It's going to take a lot of faith. And here's the thing that we have to deal with. Sometimes we're making our stand and what we're seeing is not the results that we would expect to happen when we make our stand. And because of the results that we see, we begin to lose our faith. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of, look at this, what we do not see. So I'm standing firm in faith for my family, but everything I see, my family's falling apart. I'm standing in faith for my marriage, but everything I see says my marriage is falling apart. 
I'm standing in faith for my children that they'll be born again, and everything I see is they're just running farther and farther away from God. And as we get our eyes on the things that we see in the natural, we begin to lose our faith, and we begin to let our guard down and not make our stand in faith. But the Bible says our eyes have to be eyes of faith. We have to see the unseen. We have to see people the way Jesus sees them. We have to look into the future and see what Jesus desires for the future of our children, for our relationships, for our job situations. We have to get a word from God. We have to stand firm in faith. And we don't need to be drawn away by what we're seeing in the natural. As a matter of fact, whenever we do that, we're going to have a real problem because then we're going to want to live by sight and we're just going to become lazy. We're going to kind of put our sword down, put our guard down, become lazy. Then we're going to be like a, I would say like a ball tossed around in a pinball machine. You know, you pull a little plug, the ball rolls up, ding, 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 hits some bells, bang, 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 it bounces off the bumper, it's here, it's there, it's all over the place. That is not how God intends to, for us to live our lives. He's got a purpose and a plan for us. It's by faith that we stand. We're going to stand firm on God's Word. We're going to stand firm in faith. Hebrews 6.12 says, you don't want to become lazy. You got to keep making your stand. Don't become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. You'll find God's promises in His Word. If you're new today, one of the things I want to give you before we leave today is a, a Bible promise book, which tells you all the promises for God has for you and your life. But we have to stand firm on two things. We have to stand firm in faith, and we have to have patience as well. So I got a next step for you. The second next step says this. It says, I will imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. Those mighty men and women of faith, you read about them all in Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. Look at the way they stood in faith. Look at the way they had patience. Two things, faith and patience. Imitate them and you stand firm in Christ Jesus as well. Everyone say, I stand firm in faith. You're standing firm in your faith. Now speaking of patience, that rolls right into our next one. Stand with patience and know that the Lord is coming soon. Now, I want to just ask you a little informal survey here. How many of you believe that Jesus is coming soon? How many of you believe that Jesus returns closer this year than it was last year? Of course, that's a no-brainer, all right? It's got to be, like, technically, tomorrow, his, it'll be closer than today, right? And on, if we're here on Tuesday, it'll be closer than it was on Monday. Every day it gets closer, bottom line. Uh, that's the math, right? But uh, you know what we're saying. I'm picking at you. You know that what we're saying is, when I look around the world, I look at the situations, I see that the return of Jesus could be soon, could be very soon. There's nothing in Scripture that holds Jesus back from the rapture at this point of taking us up to be with Him. We're going to have a whole series later on in the fall called The End, and we're going to look at the end and see what's going to happen there in the end. But in the meantime, what are we supposed to do? Well, James 5, 8 says, you too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So while we're waiting for Jesus to come back, we need to do two things. We need to be patient, and we need to stand firm. We don't need to give up. We don't need to quit. We don't need to turn back. We need to be patient, and we need to stand firm. Now, earlier, I read you 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. I want to read it again. It says, be on your guard. Stand firm in faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Be on your guard, be alert, be awake. Now, there's two things that that word alert talks about in Scripture. It talks about being alert to the coming of Christ Jesus, to be expecting it. It also talks about being alert to our enemy who's coming to attack us and to pull us away from the stand that we're making. As a matter of fact, 1 Peter 5, 8, 9 says, Be alert and be of sober mind. Be alert and be a sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm. How? Standing firm in what? In faith. That was our earlier point. Stand firm in faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering that you're experiencing as well. 
So we have to stand firm and we need to watch out for our enemy who's coming like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, the Hazel family is over here. I saw you come in, uh, Jeremy and Claudia back there. They were missionaries for many years over in East Africa. And uh, Jeremy shared an interesting story with me about how whenever you get over there in a bush and you hear some of the things that happen, it helps you to understand the Scripture. And one of the things that he told me was that oftentimes what the lions would do is over here hidden in the brush, the lionesses would lay in wait. They would lay quietly over here in the brush and say, so you're standing here at the podium. So all of a sudden over here, you hear a roaring lion, Rawr! right? What are you going to do when you hear the lion? You're going to run. And you're going to turn and you're going to run this way. And you're going to run right into the mouth of the lionesses who are just waiting for you so they can eat you and devour you. Now, don't tell me them lionesses aren't as bad as those lions. We know, ladies. We know. Okay, so, so, yeah, so the, yeah, they're, they're waiting right there to eat you and destroy you. What a trick. What a trick of the devil. So I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about the story Jeremy told me. I thought, well, here we are. We're trying to make our stand, and the lion roars. And what we need to do, we don't need to run. We need to stay and face the roaring lion on the Word of God. We need to stand in faith, and we need to defeat our enemy. Because if we tuck tail and run, we're going to run right into the mouth of the lionesses. And oftentimes what happens, we're trying to make our stand in faith and the enemy raises his head. Maybe it's a situation, a, a sickness that comes into life. I, I lost a job. It's a, it's a roar, a fear that comes our way. And oftentimes when we turn and run, rather than staying and fighting, we run into what I would call right into the mouth of unhealthy coping mechanisms. So I was fearful, so therefore I began to drink. Just a little wine at first for the stomach's sake. Ha, ha, ha. The only scripture I really know. And then, uh, so, and then, you know, a little more and a little more. Or I run into this relationship, this unhealthy relationship, maybe a sexual relationship. I, I run into this pride. I, I run into pouring myself into work. I run into my career. I, I run into uh, wealth and trying to gain the wealth of the world. All the unhealthy mechanisms which would devour me rather than just making my stand when the lion roars. He said, by faith, Christ Jesus, we're more than conquerors. By faith, we're overcomers. Greater is he in me than he that's in the world. By faith, we have the victory. And you stand and you fight rather than run. Watch out, your enemy, the devil, is out like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Speaking of spiritual warfare, the next thing would be this. Wearing the whole armor of God allows you to stand firm in faith. You better get your armor on. Ephesians 6, 14 through 17 says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in its place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Your sword is not like this. Your sword is that Bible you hold in your hands. That is your sword, the Word of God. Now, I want to tell you, that's too much to unpack in this sermon, so in two weeks... We're going to have a whole sermon on the armor of God. The Bible says we should rest, dress ourselves in armor of light, in the armor of God. So that's coming. But I will say, we're going to just go ahead and declare it right now. Everybody say, I will make my stand wearing the armor of God. I'm going to make my stand wearing the armor of God. So we're making our stand. The last thing is this, the last point. We want to make a unified stand. A unified stand. Let me ask you, does anybody know what's going to happen in 2024? Anybody know? Anybody know what's going to happen at the end of 2023? Does anybody know what's going to happen next week? Tomorrow? This afternoon? Now you're getting, well, I kind of got an idea. I think it has to do NAP. But anyway, but anyway so, you know, so, but you kind of get an idea, but we don't know. That's why I love the very, far, the very first words in this scripture. It's this, 
Philippians, as Paul was writing to church in Philippi, chapter 1, verse 27 says, whatever happens, we don't know. So whatever happens, I don't care what happens, something's going to happen, but whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you, he's talking about when I come and visit, whether I come to see you or hear about you in my absence, I will know. I'm going to know that you're doing what? You're standing firm. I'm going to have that confidence that you're standing firm. You're standing firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Church, my heart's desire is to see us standing firm here at Believer's Church. We're standing firm in one spirit. We're standing firm, striving together, working together, making it happen together, believing God together, and we're standing firm as one. We're standing firm in the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I think about Shema standing in that field, one man able to defeat an entire army, I think, well, what would it look like for hundreds of us to be standing together? What kind of victory could God bring about in the world when we all stand together in unity? It's from the place of unity. Psalms 33 tells us that God commands the blessings on our lives. So we want to walk together in unity. In the Revolutionary War, there was a song written, the Liberty Song. You're familiar with these lines from John Dickerson that said, by uniting, we stand. By dividing, we do what? We fall. By uniting, we stand. By dividing, we fall. Benjamin Franklin said it in a less eloquent way. He said, if, you, if we do not hang together, we'll do what? Hang separately. In other words, we don't hang out and get all on the same page together. We're all going to end up hanging separately. Listen, Jesus came up with this before they did. This was his sentiment. He said this in um, Mark chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. Jesus said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will not stand. Bottom line, that's the truth. If a kingdom divided against itself, that kingdom will not stand. Now, I'll just tell you this. We don't get into politics here at Believer's Church, but our nation is in trouble because we're about 50-50 right now on our beliefs and where we stand. And the Bible, God's Word is true. We can't deny God's Word. We can pretend like it's not going to happen. But the Bible says if we continue on this path, our nation will fall. A nation divided against itself will not stand. So what are we to do as believers? We're to do our best to walk in unity with one another we don't need to worry about Democrats or Republicans. Uh, the, the Democrats aren't the enemy. The Republicans aren't the enemy. As a matter of fact, we're all children of God. And Jesus loves everyone and wants us to love one another like he loves us as well. And as a matter of fact, the Bible describes these political parties as, as factions. And those are described in Galatians chapter 5, which says that they are works of the flesh. And the Bible says we're not to walk in the works of the flesh, but we're to walk in the, the, work, we're to walk in the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we don't need to walk in the flesh. We need to be united with one another. We cannot be united with people that know Christ Jesus. We can get along with them, but we can't walk in unity with them. But we can walk in love with each other. We can walk in love within this church. We can lay aside all these factions and all division and try to turn this tide so that our nation will not fall. A nation divided against itself will not stand. Guess what else it says? A house divided against itself will not stand either. A family divided against itself will not stand. A church divided against itself will not stand. We've got to find unity. We've got to find peace. We've got to find forgiveness. We, we've been blessed here at Believer's Church to have a very strong sense of unity here. I pray that we keep that up. I've been in churches before, part of a church before, that that was not the case. 
But whenever a church gets in disunity, the church will fall. When marriages get in disunity, the marriage will fall. When families get into disunity, the family will fall. A house divided against itself will not stand. We need to stand united in unity. Everybody say, in unity, unity. we commit to make our stand. We want to stand together in unity. Let me close with this last verse. Paul started off this whole letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, verse 1, by saying that we stand on the gospel. Fast forward 57 verses later. You thought I was long-winded. 57 verses later, Paul concludes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. And he says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, what do you need to do? What's the two words? Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not in vain. Now, today, our last next step is this. I want you to commit today. Check it on your card. Turn your card in today. Commit to me that you will memorize 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Everybody say, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always giving yourselves fully to the Lord. Because you know that your labor and the Lord is not in vain. All right, let's say it again. Let's just start right with stand firm. Everyone say, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that it doesn't say that. But God, yes, it does. You know that your labor and the Lord is not in vain. I want you to commit that to memory. Staff, we're going to have to commit that to memory this week. Joe, be ready for a uh, pop quiz, okay? I'm giving you the heads up. Okay, so uh, I want you to shine, so be ready. So anyway, so we're going we're gonna to memorize that together. Can't think of a better thing to do. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Then your work in the Lord's not in vain. As you fight the battles, you may not always see the immediate victory, but the victory is coming. It's right around the corner, and you will be victorious in the end. So, Father God, we just come to you today in the name of Jesus. And as we make our stand, Jesus, we declare that we will stand firm in you. We'll stand firm on that gospel because there's no better way to live. Now, speaking of the gospel, you cannot stand firm in the gospel if you have not yet received Jesus as your Savior. You can't walk in unity with other believers if you've not yet received Jesus as your Savior either. So I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to confess your sins, ask Jesus to forgive you, and Jesus is going to fill you with life. And you're going to be what the Bible describes, born again. You're going to come into a relationship with God. We're not going to ask you to come to the front. We're not going to ask you to tell everybody what your sins are. It's going to be between you and Jesus. You're going to pray right where you're, seat, you're seated at. And we're going to receive Jesus as our Savior today. So if every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to open my eyes and look around and say, Are you ready? Is today your day? Are you ready to be forgiven of your sins and receive Jesus as your Savior to make your stand on Him and on the gospel? If so, would you just lift your hand right now and say, Pastor Scott, that's me. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. Yes, ma'am, to my left. Yes, sir, to my left. I see your hand. Could be like you've tried everything else and it's not working. So maybe it's time to try Jesus and let Him radically change your life. Maybe you're watching online as well, so you can raise your hand on, at your home, and Jesus will see it. We won't, but he will. You could indicate that in the comments that you did it also. But let's pray together as a church right now for these that have their hands up. And I want you to pray as if you were sitting in a room with them all by themselves, just you and them. And I want everyone to say, Father God, thank you for your love for me. Thank you, Jesus for dying on the cross 
that paid a price for my sins. Forgive me for my sins, my shortcomings, my long list of wrongdoings. Wash me clean. Jesus, I die to myself. Now, Lord Jesus, I ask you to breathe your spirit into me. Let me be alive in you. Save me, deliver me, and help me to make my stand. I receive you today. I believe and I receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. It's a good guy.